very happy to be here. I'm Dean of Columbia University School of the Arts, and it is um, more than an honor and more than a joy Thank to you. get to be with you. Thank you. Um, I'm Marin Alsop, you know, but I will tell you anyway, she's an American conductor and a violinist, and she is currently music director of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra and conductor of honor of the Sao Paulo State Symphony Orchestra and chief conductor of the Yena Radio Symphony Orchestra and so many, so many other things. Um, she's really one of the most renowned conductors in the world. She travels extensively, conducting, teaching, advocating for diverse youth groups uh, and for orchestras uh, composed of youth, as you saw last night, um, and for women conductors in particular. Um, those of you who were at the International Call for Unity and Joy concert last night, I think will agree that it was one of the great experiences of our lives. Uh, and I say this as someone who, whose plane was five hours late and who was on the Davos bus <laughs> while the concert was happening and watching it on my phone and, and weeping. I told Mart, I'm in the bus and I was just weeping. Um, it was so beautiful. Um, with the European Union Youth Orchestra and the choir of the Sao Paulo Symphony and soloists from so many different countries. It was just a statement about what the arts can do, what music can do, what humans can do together. It, it was, so my first question, or my first topic to talk about, um, I live in a world of many art forms, uh, theater and visual art, writing, but I have always thought, even though it's not my expertise, that music of all forms was the most immediate to the human organism, that we respond to music. It comes right into our bodies, right into our senses, right into our spirit, more directly than any other form, and also translates across culture more directly and more immediately. So I just, as someone who's spent her life living it, I just thought I'd start there and ask you your thinking on that. Sure, well, um, I think that we're all born uh, hot-wired for music. You know, when people say to me, well, oh, I'm tone deaf, you know, or I can't carry tune, or I can't sing, I, I really want to go back with them in history to, who, to that person that told them that, because <laughs> that is not true. Every single human being can sing, can feel music. We're just, it's just, and when people also, people feel, feel sometimes hesitant in coming to enjoy classical music because they don't know enough, they don't feel educated enough. And I say, but that's not, you don't need any education because you're human. So you can experience the beauty of music. And everyone has a song that reminds them of something or a melody and you, you're transported. That's, the, you know, music can, it can connect with us so directly. It's almost like a dream, you know, and transport you to another time in your life or another place or another, another planet in a way. So my teacher, my mentor, Leonard Bernstein, if you ever um, uh, watch him, uh, there, he did uh, the Norton Lectures at Harvard, and he postulated that he, the first human word was not spoken, it was sung. <laughs> and I agree, you know, and it, when you think about kids, they're always intoning. You know, language comes from, from singing, really. Mm -hmm. You don't just suddenly speak a word. You have to, mm -hmm, you have to really work it through a lot. So I think music is just, it, it's part of being human. So I think that's why it's able to transcend those boundaries. What you said just now is so correct, that music can take you back in time. Um, it can... <coughs> It can move you to uh, sometimes very painful things and sometimes very joyful yeah, things. Sure. And there are times when you just can't listen to something because it reminds you of people or a, a time in your life or a loss. Mm -hmm. It's just so, it, it goes right to pain. And then there's music that the minute you hear it, everything seems to go away and you just feel elated. I always think that music somehow uh, defies gravity in a way, that it, it's like grace, you know, it just takes it the doesn't. weight, the you, weightiness. You know, and you think, about, you think about when you were a teenager or, or if you have teenage kids that, you know, music is a, a, it's a rebellion. It's a way of expressing yourself. It's a way of uniting you with your peers. 
So, uh, I mean, it's a very, very, very powerful medium, I think. And a way of making you feel that you're not young anymore when you can't relate to the generation, the music of a particular new generation when you think, wow, I, I just, I can't hear this. I don't get it, right. I, I, I get it, or I don't get it, but I, I don't want to get it, or, you know, <laughs> something about you just resists it. You yeah. know, it's like, whoa, why is this happening now? Yeah, <laughs> you know? definitely. Um, you've spoken about the f when you uh, went to a Leonard Bernstein concert before he became your mentor and friend, and, um, and you were with your father, who was a musician, and you, you just knew, uh, I want to do that. I want to be a conductor. So I'm, I, I, I'm curious, like, what you saw that made you think, that's what I want to do. You know, it's, um, I, I'm always amazed at the musicians that come from, I have a very good friend who grew up on a turkey farm, and she plays the viola. Now, I, I don't know how you get from a turkey farm to playing the viola. That, to me, is really, that's something magical. I was, yeah, really, I was born, um, my, both of my parents were professional musicians, so, you know, they didn't necessarily want a child, they needed a pianist, so that's why I was born. And uh, so- That's why they, they had you? Yeah, they needed a trio, so that was the idea. Um, and I hated the piano, and uh, so, to make a long story short, I, I retired from piano when I was six, and uh, <laughs> then I, uh, then they tricked me into playing the violin. But luckily, I loved playing the violin. Uh, you know, and, and that made me also understand that for every child, there is an instrument. So if you played an instrument growing up, another thing I'd like to go back with you, and you know, it didn't click, it's because it wasn't your instrument. Mm. I really believe that's true. It was um, true of the accordion for me, I have to say. Well, it's <laughs> probably a, a relief a for everyone around you too, but. <laughs> <laughs> that was the Polish, the po the Polish thing. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and I loved playing the violin, and I loved, I, I got pretty good, and I could, when I was about eight, I, I was in Juilliard pre-college, you know, no pressure from my parents. And um, <laughs> I loved playing in the orchestra, I loved the sound, and, but they, the director called my parents in because everyone was complaining about some kid, in, some little kid in the back of the second violin who was trying to lead the whole orchestra. <laughs> so, you know, I was already thinking, oh, this classical music thing is just not going to work out for me. It's, it's so many rules <laughs> to follow, even, even for me then. And luckily, my dad took me to a concert shortly thereafter. I think I was about nine years old. And the guy came out to conduct. And he, first, he was, he was wearing a turtleneck, which I thought, oh, that's different. And then he turned around and started talking to us about the music and sharing you know, why, he, why we should listen to this piece, what was interesting about it. Uh, that was really interesting to me. And then he turned around and started jumping around like a crazy person. And I thought, oh, I can be the conductor and not get in any trouble and have fun. <laughs> so that was it for me. I was sold. And, but, uh, and that was Leonard Bernstein who was conducting. Um, who then you worked with very much, right? He yeah, I mean, he eventually, I eventually became his student, but he was my hero. I had two posters on my wall, a big one of Leonard Bernstein and then a smaller one of the Beatles. <laughs> so that was, that was my musical, you know, inclination. And it, it's ironic because um, Bernstein loved the Beatles. And one night when I was on tour with him, he played every single Beatles song for me. He knew every word at oh. the piano. I wish before oh. cell phones, you know. Uh -huh. I, I wish I had a, but I have it at least in my head. There's a video somewhere that I saw, uh, watched when I was trying to learn more about you. And he rushes you. You're very young and you're conducting and he rushes up on the stage. Oh yeah, at the when end. I finish and he but runs I, up. I thought, oh, I held my breath went because I thought, oh, he, did he knock you over almost? I mean, he was like, just came on the stage, right? Yeah, he, uh, he, <laughs> he would not done well in the Me Too uh, moment, you know. I mean, he had no sense of personal space at all whatsoever. <laughs> he was always, he was like, he'd be coming, everybody would be like, look out, here he comes. Wait, no kisses, okay. Not, <laughs> yeah, he was crazy. <laughs> to jump up on the stage. All right. Yeah, as well. um, okay, so now, um, you do a lot of master classes for women uh, conductors, and I think they're fascinating, and if, any of you are interested in this topic at all, you should watch them because I learned a lot just conceptually about conducting from watching you. And what I was so interested in particularly was with one woman conductor where you stand next to her and you make her breathe with you. That she's not breathing correctly. So I, I wish to just talk about that because it made me think, well, if the orchestra 
is an organism functioning together. Is the conductor the breath? Are the lungs? Is the conductor the head, the brain? Like, it, it was, it's such an interesting idea that if you're not breathing, then maybe the orchestra can't breathe. But I, I just well, wanted it, you to talk about that. I mean, that. conducting is such a, it's such an abstract thing because I'm, you know, no matter how much I wave my ar arms, I make no sound, you know, and uh, so, <laughs> so it's completely dependent on trying to enable the people around me to be the best they can be. But the and, minute you lift your arm, well, it usually starts. something happens. Yes. Yeah, um, <laughs> whether it's good or I can't, you know, that that's that's something to, to debate. But um, it's all about it's all about body language. I mean, that's the first thing, gesture. And mm -hmm. I can watch five young conductors, and any of you could do it too. It would be clearly obvious with this same piece, same orchestra, and I guarantee you, you could also tell. It sounds completely different, and it's it's because of the way they move, the way they breathe, the way it's very individualistic, you know, very dependent on all of those things. And so breathing is important because if you're going to invite someone to play that is playing a, a wind instrument or brass instrument, if you don't breathe, the sound is tight. And if your gesture is, is harsh, the sound is also harsh. And the musicians aren't necessarily even aware of this, but you can hear it. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I mean, it, it's a complex thing. And then, of course, when you add the societal interpretation of gesture from women, which is diff very different from the same gesture um, from a man is interpreted very differently than it is from a woman. So, you know, when, when my female students will come and conduct and, you know, sort of dainty like that, I said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. Because then it's, it's girly or it's lightweight or whatever. But when a guy, <laughs> guy does that, it's sensitive. I mean, it's, I'm, it's, I, have no, I have no judgment on it. It's just the way mm -hmm. society looks at things differently. And when a woman you know, really wants to get a big sound, you know, there's, a, there's a line that if you cross, everybody, it's like, mm. you know, you're called the B word. So you have to really figure <laughs> out. Does that translate into all languages? Yes, I think so. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> in German, it might be no, but uh, I think uh, so. It, it's very, it's very interesting, and 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 also, also it's always every day is something new because the organism constantly changes. I work with a different orchestra almost every week, so it's a, a different being. Why do you think there is so much resistance, or has been historically, to women as conductors? What? Wh you know, is it like women directors of film where it's just a leadership issue that men just simply don't want women at the helm? Or do you think there's something intrinsic to the nature of music, classical music? Oh, no. I, I think it's, I really think it's a, it's a comfort level. I mean, this is, I'm always asked this question, of course, I, my response usually is, well, I, I'm probably not the right person to ask. You should ask some of the men that question because for me, I, you know, I want to promote women in this field, um, but I think that as a society, it takes a long time for us to be comfortable with ro roles, especially with different looking people in yeah. roles. I mean, I try to think back when I was growing up, when I was a kid, you know, it was always um, two white guys on TV anchoring the news. That's what it was. And then sort of gradually like this one woman, Barbara Walters, she came in, you know, and that was really uncomfortable for a while. And then we got over that and they let Jane Pauley through. You know what I mean? So a couple women, and then, then everybody got comfortable mm -hmm. with one man, one woman. Then it, then it morphed, you know, so that we saw more people of color and this and that. And now uh, I think it's just, it just takes volume of mm -hmm. seeing people in certain roles to, to become change. comfortable. But from my perspective, I assumed naively that there would be a lot more women coming into my field as I was going. But then five years passed and 10 years, 15 years, I said, well, 
this is ridiculous. I, it, and if I don't do something about it, who will change this landscape? So in 2002, I started a fellowship for women conductors. And um, I named it after my, my non-musical mentor, the gentleman that helped me start my first orchestra, Tomi Otaki. He's a, he, he owned Ancline Klein Clothing. He was not in music at all. He didn't even like classical music, actually. But he liked you. Uh, he, you know, he, for some reason. And uh, <laughs> he supported the orchestra. And so this fellowship has uh, really, I think, helped quite a lot because it's very important that the women... Conducting isn't like anything else. You, you can't practice it unless you have 20 or 40 friends that come over every day. You know, there's no instrument. So and a large apartment. Yeah, you really you need a lot, a lot, a lot of <laughs> beer and pizza. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah. so that's a huge challenge. Yeah. So you can't get opportunities. And the most important thing to me is that you you have to have the chance to fail in order to become successful. And if you only have one chance, you know it doesn't go well. Well, usually. especially in a profession where it's not predisposed to want you to succeed necessarily. So it becomes even more difficult to, fa to fail in public. There's that. Yeah. yeah, there's that. Talk also about, um, I mean, you're changing the profession in so many ways, so that it's activist part of your life, and, 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 and it's a totality in your life, which makes it even more wonderful. Can you talk about the youth orchestras and how, what you've been thinking about that and, and what motivated that? And, and then we'll watch a small clip of um, Sao Paulo. Oh, sure. Um, well, I, I think it goes back to this, you know, when I had to play the piano and I hated the piano, that's, that's part of it. Um, wanting, also wanting every kid to have the opportunity to learn a musical instrument and learn an instrument that they like. And also, I, I'm motivated by wanting to see the same diversity on stage that I see in, in my community. And that's definitely missing in, in the orchestras because not every child has the same opportunity to access, you know, playing an instrument. So when I went to Baltimore in uh, 2007, I um, I thought, why don't why don't we try to start a program that can give access to these young kids, and especially in West Baltimore. And so I started with 30 30 kids in one school, and now we have 2,000 kids playing musical instruments. And our our very first class has just graduated from high school, is just graduating from high school. And our first ORCID, it's called Orchestra Kids, um, ORCID. Our first ORCID um, was accepted, I couldn't believe it, uh, to the Hart School of Music on the flute. I mean, I thought it would take generations, you know, for it to really sink in. And uh, she sent me a note a couple days ago that she, she loves school, and she sent me her grades in the email because she made the honor roll, the president's uh, list. And you know, to me, this is, um, this is really important. When I see these kids playing, I realize that you know, it's, only, it's all about access. Right. That's all it is. Uh, every kid has this capacity. Every human being has this capacity. Mm -hmm. And it's so unfortunate that we, as a society, can't create equal opportunity for everyone. So let's um, watch this clip of um, the Sao Paulo Orchestra. I'm not sure what this is. Is this about the um, Ode to Joy project? Yes, okay. and we're gonna, we're gonna shift over to that amazing project, which is actually, um, really brings together, I think, everything that we've been talking about and, and everything you've been doing. It just strikes me as one of the most fabulous projects oh, I've thank you. heard about almost ever. <laughs> so our, our group, can we do it? Okay, so it's just a minute.
a little snapshot. <laughs> yeah. Like. I want to. Um, I'd like to talk about this project because it's so astounding to me. Um, the symbolism of the Ninth Symphony yeah. uh, and the way that it has always been conjured uh, in so many different situations in the fall of the Berlin Wall and um, Tiananmen Square. I mean, so many times when people want to talk about freedom, they, they think about that. So I wanted to ask you, uh, like, where this idea to make this global ode to joy and for Beethoven's this 250th, even where did it even come from? How did it begin as an idea? Well, I think that, um, you know, for me, the, the themes, Beethoven as a, as a human being is symbolic for me of, of, of all that I aspire to. I mean, someone who, so someone who suffered, I mean, he knew in his early 20s that he was losing his hearing. And he knew, certainly by the time he was 30 years old, that it was going to be a very slow, progressive, inevitable process. And I can't imagine, can you imagine losing the one thing that makes you complete <coughs> in that kind of painful way? And of course, he went through a period of tremendous depression and even wrote a suicide note and to his brothers. and somehow found a reason to exist and stay alive. And he refused any kind of treatment, and anything that would um, cloud his creative capacity. He wouldn't go near. And he found the will to really push through this and find more inner strength and start to hear internally you know, his own world. And this is why I, I really believe that this is why he was able to transcend any other composer, because he wasn't judging it anymore. It was all created internally. And so by the time he writes his Ninth Symphony, there's a legend, legendary story that he was conducting, and I, I guess he, it was a disaster because everybody just said, just don't look up and you'll be all right. Don't look at the conductor. He was, you know, because he couldn't hear anything. So, um, but at the end of the piece, the mezzo-soprano had to turn him around so that he could see the ovation because he couldn't hear it. And everyone in the audience then realized oh. that he was completely deaf. And to write this music under that circumstance and also to always, all of his pieces have the same subtext. It's just like any author, you know, you, you write different novels, but they all have the same themes always because we are who we are. Sure. And his themes are about hope and optimism and unity and joy and the things that connect also because I think he felt so isolated as an individual because he was cut off from everybody and, and he longed for that connection. And this is a piece about connection. It's about, of course, the themes are, are about joy. And the Schiller text, which was written the, in, in the late 1700s, um, but he went back to that text because it had this, this theme of, of joy and the idea of freedom was really a, an important concept, particularly at that moment, you know, when, when you weren't allowed to really think about this. So, um, also, I have to say that um, when the Berlin Wall came down and um, my mentor, Bernstein, was there and gathered an orchestra from around the world and a choir from around the world and changed the word um, Freude, joy, to Freiheit, freedom, I thought, you know, this is emblematic of what Beethoven would have wanted. And I think that all of these things ah. together mm -hmm. made me think about creating a, a, a Beethoven Ninth Symphony with a text on the same themes, but texts that would resonate with different cultures. So this is in Portuguese, so it may not resonate so, so well, but when we did it in Sao Paulo, um, I could see the connection. And maybe last night you could see the connection that the choir had to the text, because it's their language. When we do it in Baltimore, I've had a, a friend who's a rap artist named Wordsmith. So we have a text by a rap artist. 
Um, when we do it in, um, in Africa, it's going to be in Zulu. When, I know, it's when so we do incredible. it in uh, Carnegie Hall, it's, it's by the former poet laureate of the United States. So the texts change, and also what you don't see from that is that we're adding interstitial music between the movements and before the symphony begins to try to tell the story in a way that really brings it close to the people listening. It's, a, it's such an incredible idea because I, we, we talked about the Tracy K. Smith text right. that will be in Carnegie Hall, and the last part of her text um, is asking forgiveness of the earth from the humans. And it, it, I think it will bring the house down when people hear it because it's so beautifully written. And this notion that you can take something which is so classical, which is this theme of our whole event, this conversation, and make it so immediate and contemporary and flexible. Because oh, I think the implication of classical is that it's, it's set in some way, historically yeah. set. And to take it and show this elasticity and that it can become completely relevant and the allusions to God can be, co can be completely transformed by other cultures and other languages. Uh, and I think I would love to be there when it's sung in Zulu in South Africa, uh, which is a society that's fought so hard right. um, for freedom. It, it's going to be so moving to people in a way that it would never be if it were sung in, in German. But, you know, maybe, I mean, for me, maybe it goes back to being eight years old and, you know, being told don't, don't have so much fun with classical music. And, and I also think that, I think that Beethoven didn't look at his music as a museum piece. You know, he looked at it as a living, breathing reflection of the time he lived in. Um, and so I, I hope he, he's enjoying it. I think we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Live you very much. Thank you.